Hello, this is Abed Omar of the Pakistan uh, Air Quality Initiative. Thank you for joining this live stream where we will be joined by Davar Butt and we'll be talking about uh, air pollution during uh, this COVID-19 lockdown. A uh, little bit about the Pakistan Air Quality Initiative before we start. Um, we're primarily a network of uh, ordinary citizens, community who are interested in spreading awareness about air pollution issues, and we primarily do that by having a monitoring network uh, throughout the country. We have over two dozen monitors in Lahore, a dozen monitors in Karachi, and um, our awareness efforts are what uh, is helping clean up the environment, such as improving uh, fuel standards in the country. Uh, so right now we will be joined by Davar Butt. And Davar, here Hi, you are. Abed. How are you? I cannot hear you yet, so just a moment while I check the audio on my end. Let's start with an introduction of uh, Davar Butt. He's been uh, a key part of uh, all things air pollution in Pakistan. He's an organizer of the uh, climate strike uh, that took place nationwide last year. And he's one of the few people who has a very prominent voice about all things uh, climate change, environment, and air pollution. Um, so, Davar, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, that how did you get into all of this? So, already you guys know my name. My name is Davar. Uh, the story of me getting into all of this is uh, sort of a personal history as well, because uh, as a Lahori living in Lahore, I, I got to experience firsthand how environment degradation, uh, pollution, climate change, all of this started affecting our lives within the city. And uh, I was born in Lahore, I was raised in Lahore. So I know how the, it's sort of how you feel the trajectory got, went wrong somewhere. You know the city is uh, either not functioning for its people, it's functioning for industries, transport vehicles in a sense. Uh, the living standards went up in terms of economic indicators, but the feeling of living in a comfortable city got uh, reduced over time as well. So this was uh, about 2018, and I had come back to Pakistan from uh, Europe after my MA, and uh, I had made the trip in 2017 as well. And uh, in, in my 2017 trip, I got to feel the full intensity of the smog. I was jogging one day outdoors in early morning and what you'd expect that someone, uh, a healthy individual can jog 20 minutes, 30 minutes. People who do it frequently can jog up to an hour. But I started feeling inflammation within my lungs, within my chest, chest cavity, right about five minutes, 10 minutes into the run. And uh, this was the time when we, uh, in, in early in late 2017, when Abid had started putting up air quality monitors. We knew the air quality was bad because the smog issue had come up in 2015 and 16 as well, but we didn't know how bad it was. So while experiencing it firsthand and then having infants in my own family, uh, seeing children going go to schools in this sort of uh, pollution, started resonating with me because I come from a public health background. I was a public health consultant right out of university. And uh, that is where my sort of, I would say, became a linkage between public health and environment. And from there on, uh, going deeper into the subject of how climate change and how air pollution is going to be impacting our public health system uh, as a nation and internationally when we consider the low middle income countries such as uh, our neighbor our neighboring countries so all of that becomes interlinked in a sense and uh, that is where my expertise sort of got me driven to more towards climate change and environmental economics rather than just economics or public health that's exactly one of the things that most people miss out. That, you know, when, when you talk about environment, they, they just assume that we're talking about having uh, trees planted or having uh, uh, clean streets. 
but they don't see the linkage between uh, public health. In fact, uh, we know in Pakistan that the air pollution levels are so high that it uh, should be declared a public health emergency. But Dabar, recently you did this um, series of tweets where you showed all these pictures of air pollution levels uh, compared to last year and this year. Can you tell us a little bit more about this and what are these, you know, what is the difference between the blue sky? And so the so one, uh, one uh, correction I'd like to make very early is I sort of, uh, while designing this, I ha there's a little typo if you not notice it. It's supposed to be microgram per cubic meter, but I accidentally wrote it cubic centimeter. So that's the correction uh, I'd like to state over here. Uh, what we see in this particular, in these two particular images is that what is visible pollution and what we use to uh, sort of categorize that as fog about five years ago. Everyone in Lahore was really underplaying the extent of the crisis by just saying it's fog, it's fog, it's, it's always been there. It is very, very true. It's always been in there. The, the sort of uh, view that you're seeing, it's grown worse over time, but if you go to the historical records of what Lahore's air pollution has been, even before PM 2.5 used to be a thing, if you go back to uh, total respirable particulate matter, which was the unit in the 90s, Lahore was the worst in all of the urban areas in Pakistan. So we have a record. We uh, Let me even open it for you. I have this uh, small graph from uh, back 2008 when this wasn't used, uh, wasn't an issue. And even before that, there is a record from a JICA report in uh, the year 2000. And it was largely sort of uh, saying that Lahore is probably the worst if you uh, talk about air pollution in between these cities. So let me, yeah. So I want to ask you about these pictures. So like you, you see one here from 19th April, uh, which is this nice blue sky, which is during the lock lockdown. And we see one from a couple of months ago on 1st November. And it, it's it's the same road, the same spot. And in one yeah, picture, yeah, yeah. it's reminiscent of the pollution levels that we see in places like Beijing and New Delhi. Yeah. So, so, so I put out this in, uh, image after a couple of people questioned me that uh, January's weather is supposed to be much cooler than April's weather. But both these dates, uh, the weather in Lahore was about 28 degrees in both of these photos. Uh, obviously, seasonal differences occur. You have faster winds in April. But winds alone cannot be responsible for the direct consequences we're seeing of emissions. It's a relation between the natural environment and the meteorological effect of the uh, the entire weather and then obviously you were putting out uh, you were putting out a much bigger chunk of emissions in november because you would have traffic this uh, the first november picture both of these pictures are actually 10 a.m 9 a.m 10 a.m so you also see the impact of early morning traffic on the first of november on 19th april the most of the city is shut down you don't have industries running you have uh, the power consumption around the city is down. So you just have the domestic usage, which is stable at about 50% of the power consumption. And uh, of course, when industries consume less power, the thermal power stations around Lahore are also producing much lesser power and consuming less, much less furnace oil or coal. Uh, so in a sense, the overall emission load, which Lahore used to produce in regular circumstances uh, has been removed from the picture and then you have a blue clean sky the morning are the mornings are clear whatever emission is produced is of course pushed out through the breeze that we usually have in the spring season and uh, the purpose of this uh, these pictures weren't just to show the air quality index it's to show that how the city looks when the air is clean it, it, you do not have to confuse it with smog or fog at this point. You just have to look at the pictures and see that even if you can take out the hazardous and healthy uh, comparison, just look at what sort of low PM 2.5 level, a clean AQI,
can make your city look much more presentable. And uh, when we talk about presentation, I always go back to this, is that Beijing was not going to clean up if China never had the 2008 Olympics. It became a PR issue when international athletes were coming in and they saw the bad air quality. And China was really, really angry that uh, this shouldn't have happened. Beijing usually is, uh, for citizens themselves, it wasn't a big matter because as Lahori tended to say that it's fog, it's fog, we're used to this. Citizens in Beijing used to say that this is fog, we're used to this. But when the international exposure got back... You know, know, Davar, so I used to live in Beijing. I wasn't there um, during the Olympics, but I was there uh, soon after. And uh, at that time, so we're talking about uh, 2009, um, there, there was no Twitter. Um, a lot of the you know, foreign internet was blocked in China. It was very difficult to get outside information. And at the same time, there was very little conversation about air pollution at all. So yes, uh, while they did start the cleanup action for the Olympics in Beijing, and you know what they did. Basically, they said nobody's allowed on the streets except movement related to Olympics during the Olympics themselves. All industry was shut down, uh, not just in the city, but for hundreds of kilometers outside the city. Um, Another example, more recent example, was the G20, uh, sorry, G8 uh, event that happened in Hangzhou. Not only did they shut the city down, they gave residents uh, rebates to travel outside and go on vacation and you had perfect blue skies. But um, let, let's go particularly about Beijing, is that in 2012, when the, the original, say, New York Times story broke out in, in uh, November and December, there was a lot of hue and cry that, you know, uh, the US consulates, the US embassy cannot uh, be reporting this data, and it's not allowed, and it should be shut down. and. Um, you know, like th- there was a time when people used to say that this is not fog, uh, this is not smog in the sky, but rather this is just, you know, a uh, beautiful uh, foggy day and you know how nice it is and you know how nice and misty. And I, living there, used to point out to people, look, you know, I can see this data on this uh, Twitter app and it's showing me that it's highly polluted. And they'd be like, no, no, this is nothing to worry about. And this would be in the afternoon, you'd be looking up towards the sun, it would be totally covered in a yellow haze, you can't see anything. But fast forward a year, um, Beijing, after denying the problem uh, for, for the next many months, behind the scenes, they set up a monitoring network of thousands of stations, uh, not just in Beijing, but throughout the country. And it, within uh, a year later, they started releasing the data to the public while announcing the uh, very major policies to improve air quality. So it's not that they, they, they were ignorant or, or hiding it. They, what they have done is actually exemplary, and it's a practice for anyone uh, in the world to follow, especially when you're in a place like Pakistan or India where the conversation is still very much in the early stages. Mm. Yeah, when you compare even India is sort of ahead of the curve because what Delhi experiences is very very similar to Lahore but even a notch up because Delhi itself is surrounded by a lot of urban uh, industry and settlement you have urban sprawl all around Delhi as well Uh, what what the issue with uh, even Lahore right now in Pakistan is that our own activism, our own uh, conversation and communication uh, in the uh, in the first few years sort of restricted ourselves to Lahore. But as we place more more monitors, as we saw in Gujranwala, as we are seeing with the satellite data, is that it's not even just Lahore, it's Punjab and even beyond Punjab, it's all major urban areas throughout Pakistan. And as Mahira says in our private chat, that air pollution is a worldwide issue. Uh, I think it's about time that we also take the hashtag up a notch instead of Lahore smog and start calling it what it is, that it's air pollution and it's present in all of Pakistan. Uh, That is where we, when we put out analysis, that's why we we tend to not only restrict to Lahore anymore. The recent uh, research report that we did with the Center for 
energy and clean air. Yeah, yeah. Be be before yeah. you get into into what the research uh, report was about, um, I just want to ask you a question. Yeah. So, uh, what's the backstory on that? How did you end up collaborating with CREA? So uh, the CREA is fairly new, as you might know. They, uh, it wasn't active about two, three years ago. It's fairly new. It has a lot of uh, analysts who are dealing with clean air in specific, but their backgrounds range from uh, economics, energy, uh, a lot of a lot of people from different regions, but most of them dealing with South Asia and East Asia. And uh, they were... Uh, fairly insistent that we need to put out this data and we need to start uh, put out what is happening in Pakistan uh, in the international uh, international cam in front of international cameras as well because we're seeing repeated uh, repeated analysis of what's happening in uh, Hubei what we saw what happened in uh, northern China as well everyone knows it, it became news for Reuters it was in the Financial Times and similarly, you had analysis from uh, all over India being put out in international publications, but no one was putting out data and analysis of what's happening in Pakistan. Even though Pakistan is fairly uh, similar to India in terms of its uh, economic advancement, uh, both are low middle income countries. And uh, again, Punjab suffers uh, very high levels of air, air pollution much like what northern India suffers from. So it was important to put this out. Uh, Sunil and uh, the editor at Kriya reached out that we'd already done some sort of communication work on, on this, but they wanted to f put out a formal, uh, recommend formal analysis along with recommendations, along with uh, what's happening on ground. And of course, international analysts cannot uh, pinpoint what are these hotspots. For example, even if you look at this image, Lahore's right. uh, th this particular uh, comparison shows that there there's a northwestern hotspot in Lahore, and towards the south, you have a Raivan to Patuki. So Raivan to Patuki development is fairly recent, so the hotspot isn't as big. The northwestern part of Lahore, which is the Lahore Shukhupura Road, is uh, where the motorways goes out, where the GT Road goes out as well. So you have industrial development along the GT Road and as well. So that's why it's fairly, it's very, very, it's not densely populated. It's just pockets of industrial zones. And all of these industrial zones are powered by small furnace oil power plants, uh, or they have their own diesel generator setups. So this is why you see the hotspots and the hotspots uh, while Lahore's urban emissions went down and it turned blue from orange. Those hotspots are still sort of slightly blue because, you know, the thermal power stations are going to remain active. The some of the that, that is one of the big issue with, when you look at analysis like this from a layman's perspective, because the, the initial uh, picture is showing you, yes, you know, it's no longer a hot spot over Lahore or over Sheikhupura. And, you know, not, now everything looks blue and r rosy. But what's really hiding behind this is that the pollution levels are still above safe limits in spite yep. of this dramatic reduction that we're seeing here. So, um, in, in my opinion, that is what, what is really the big story here, that why haven't the air pollution levels come down even more drastically uh, this is what we had uh, we were questioning what was happening in china and the re reason that was given to us is that beijing still had a little bit of smog uh, wuhan had bad air as late as january even though the cities were on lockdown and the simple reason for that was that a lot of energy in these areas still comes from coal power plants and Beijing is dotted with steel industry on its outskirts. So in that sense, uh, we see a, a similar analysis for Lahore as well, that industrial hotspots or industries, especially industries which cannot be abruptly shut down, usually tend to uh, whatever sort of calamity that might hit, you would have minimal workforce but the processes the furnaces the generators will have to remain on because a lot of people a lot of these industrialists 
do not want them to go offline because turning them back on is usually more expensive and uh, this is uh, much more noticeable in for karachi's analysis as well you, you know one thing that, that a lot of people uh, uh, don't know is that practically all the industry in pakistan besides using you know the, the ones you're talking about uh, having to keep their furnaces in operation all the industry generates its own power they do not rely on the national grid for the energy supply so um, all around lahore uh, shekhupura especially the big textile industries uh, who are running these steam boilers they're actually using coal um, as their energy source and when you're talking about small uh, uh, power generation on a very very small scale you, you know you're talking about maybe 1 megawatt or a couple of megawatts this is extremely inefficient so while while i do believe that most of it has been shut down during the lockdown this is one of the uh, major contributors to air pollution in the area and um, I've heard in years before when there's been a shortage of coal, people have been actually using wood uh, as well or, or whatever fuel, you know, plastic. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, yeah. Uh, this and is tires. the the particularly when you talk about just running the boilers and maybe the brick kilns, you really have, can be assured what sort of fuel that's going into these things because uh, in a lot of cases it's just piles of trash that are burned as a fuel source. so in a sense uh, even our analysis cannot be as in depth or disaggregate all of these all of what's happening right now but we can at least pinpoint that these are zones that went offline and these are areas where you see still see hot spots but overall central lahore and some industrial areas still had no2 levels which are beyond uh, what is recommended by who or which even is beyond by the emission quality standards for punjab and the national emission quality standards oh there is a question uh, uh, from regarding the link between covid and air quality i think uh, what we have so far been pointed is that air quality wherever it's bad to have a much more vulnerable immune system much more vulnerable respiratory system and that tends to make you more vulnerable to uh, the sort of respiratory uh, attack that happens as a result of covid-19 and uh, a lot of these patients uh, especially in the us where much more data and reporting is coming from uh, suffer really really horrible respiratory attacks and these are very uh, onset of these is very this is very sudden they also experience seizures and air pollution is also uh, some something that usually tends to be responsible or behind these sort of uh, sudden onsets and uh, diseases what covid-19 is going to do is people who have already uh, have been exposed to high levels of air pollution like in punjab in north india in china uh their systems are already weak especially their respiratory systems and uh, that gives a chance to the the virus itself that an already compromised immune system and already compromised respiratory system is not going to withstand for long against the full onset of the virus uh there's a difference some people have the virus might not feel the symptoms as such the asymptom- a lot of asymptomatic cases but people who are really vulnerable especially the 50 plus demographic is uh, they have suffered from bad air in the past few years but the bad air has now sort of uh, disarmed them to fight a virus that is going to attack their respiratory system and obviously air quality poor air quality did not cause the virus itself but in any region that suffers from bad air quality is going to uh, probably be much more susceptible to have a much bigger out- outbreak of covid-19 this was i was just answering this question in the chat right exactly right. um j- j- just wanted to ask here also that i mean 
how, how does one protect oneself from uh, coronavirus? We've all been hearing about the mask uh, debate. So what, what is your take on masks? And yes, so and if, you, if you remember when you were in Lahore last year, I brought up the subject of how masks make you really, really uncomfortable, especially if you're exercising and jogging outside. You have this buildup of humidity. You also have, uh, you, you can basically feel the discomfort at hand. But at least it's protecting your health. At this point, the wearing a mask has been normalized so much that people are even wearing cloth masks, which might not be as effective, but at least they have forgone the discomfort aspect of the entire usage of masks. And of course, that is encouraging because maybe you'll have more people using masks during the smog season. You will also be... That, that, that is absolutely true. That, that, you know, up till a couple of months ago, when um, people like us who were more aware about this issue and wanted to take some basic steps to, you know, protect ourselves from air pollution, uh, I would be going around wearing masks and uh, some of my family and friends would be doing the same. But it was uh, very awkward in a way because people would be looking at you and wondering, what is this? So yeah. e even in China, masks uh, sort of got an early normalization back in uh, 2003 when uh, SARS hit. SARS happened, yeah. And, and um, in fact, all across uh, Asia, like in Japan and South Korea, masks entered the mainstream. And while living in Beijing, you know, in, in the beginning, yes, you did see a lot of people wearing masks. Uh, if, if you travel on an airplane, you often see an Asian looking person wearing a mask and, you know, you'd wonder what all that was about. So uh, masks were not used uh, over there initially uh, to be protecting yourself from smog or air pollution yeah. at all. It was rather just, you know, protecting yourself from bacteria and viruses uh, that might be in the air. Um, fast forward to today, everyone is saying, you know, wear a mask. Uh, if you can't get an N95 mask, if you can't get, you know, something very specific, then uh, wear a cloth mask. So in fact, um, uh, one of the messages um, that I have to people, uh, which, you know, is not something new for me. I've been saying that for years, like, you know, you should be taking basic steps to protect yourself. If you um, can't, don't have a mask, if you don't have an air purifier, those are very expensive things uh, to have in Pakistan, um, then at least uh, be aware of the air pollution levels. Don't go out um, if you can avoid it. But if you do go out, wear a mask and wear whatever mask you can afford, you know, um, put a handkerchief over your face, put a cloth mask, put a surgical mask, an N95 mask. Um, I also fashioned one mask out of cloth just for my own checking that, you know, why can't just every Pakistani be wearing a cloth mask? So they're very easy to make. Everyone has, um, you know, well, not everyone, a lot of people have a sewing machine at home. They have leftover fabrics. In fact, it's pretty common in Pakistan to be uh, making your own dresses. You might not make that at home, but you'll go buy uh, the fabric and you go to your tailor and you'll spend time designing it. So it's very easy for a lot of people, for a big segment of society here, to be able to put on some kind of a mask or the other. So, yeah, and and one thing, another thing that we discussed earlier as well is that uh, the the virus itself is raising a lot of awareness around uh, medical equipment and protective devices. So there is a high chance that local manufacturing at a large scale, or even for very local purposes, is going to be, happen, and that will reduce the prices of these masks in the off season. Say for whenever the virus does end you'll have a lot of these masks in the local market for low cost. And then the willingness to pay for these particular respiratory protective equipments is, of course, going to adjust it with the market prices. Uh, this hopefully will increase awareness around protective masks and uh, and uh, probably a byproduct of all, a lot of this is going to be uh, more awareness, uh, people protecting themselves better. And as a result, a lot, in a lot of cities, we'll see that pollution-linked uh, burden on hospitals, on public health system, may reduce because people are now 
willing to buy these masks and know the sort of benefit of having them. So um, here, I just wanted to like very briefly visit um, why these kind of simple solutions are effective. So um, let's just talk about you know how masks really work. So here you're looking at um, the size of a PM10 particle. You're looking at a red blood cell. You're looking at a PM2.5 particle. You're looking at a typical bacteria. And finally, you see the 0.1 micron size, which is um, the, the, the size of the coronavirus. There have been a lot of studies that have shown that masks can filter down to 0 0.007 microns. Uh, both masks and HEPA filters, which are commonly used uh, in air purifiers. So yeah. um, effectively, what masks are doing, they're preventing these particulates, whether they be coronavirus or, or smog, from entering in. And when you prevent them from coming in, um, they're also then prevented from, you know, uh, being exposed to your mouth, to your nose, and eventually entering your respiratory system where they start to create havoc. Um, so... It is a very, very simple step that people can do if you're out in public. Um, li like I came across this wonderful example of, you know, when is it appropriate to wear a mask? It's the same as when is it appropriate to be wearing, uh, you know, your trousers out in public. You're not walking around naked in public. So th that's the, the thing. You should be wearing a mask all the time when you're in public. So and uh, one thing, one thing that in during the earlier outbreak we were confused if what is the size of the coronavirus, and some people argued that the coronavirus particle itself is too small to be filtered. And later on, as we have more research available, uh, what's what happens is that the coronavirus uh, particle itself is transferred through aeros aerosol that comes out as a result of sneezing or coughing, or if you just breathe out. Uh, and aerosols, uh, what we've usually seen is that aerosol particles are ranged from 0.3 to 2.5 microns. And those particles it's themselves carry the virus. So this is why masks are actually effective, that masks stop the aerosol particles which carry the virus. And this is why masks in some cases have to be re-sterilized. And if you want to reuse them, you sterilize them again and again, because the aerosol particle is either stuck to the surface of the mask or if it's a cloth mask, maybe in in one of the layers of the cloth. But at the same time, all the masks available, even a simple T-shirt is effective. And uh, all, all individuals, it should be at this point, it should be a part of the policy. And I think the KP government, uh, Temu Jhagra, who is the health minister in KP, has actually made this a policy that citizens coming out for buying groceries, etc., should wear a mask and probably should be a policy all over the country. Talk, talking of policy, one thing which people, uh, which is very critical, is that when you do talk about N95 masks, um, then you're also talking about certifications. And so mm. people should not be just willy nilly saying that th this mask is N95 or, or you know, what, what's criminal is cell, uh, uh, the textile industry here has started selling isolation gowns and other, you know, protective uh, gear, which are used in hospitals, made out of fabrics or made out of uh, materials which are not appropriate for that application. Okay. So that is something everyone should know. Wear a mask, but you should know that um, it is giving you a certain level of protection. Maybe you're getting, um, you know, 80% protection, but you're not getting the certified 95 or 99% protection. And people selling them as that, that is very, very misleading and actually yeah. should be considered a criminal. And, and, and a lot, in a lot of cases, people who uh, have made masks are probably not going to get certifications anyway because a lot of international manufacturers are already in line with uh, on these bodies like NIOSH or China's National Accreditation. Uh, all of these uh, manufacturers themselves are not getting uh, accreditation at this point. So at least uh, government procurement officers should be concerned about what sort, sort of equipment they're getting. Have some sort of basic level testing at least within Pakistan. But exactly. don't pretend to give out certifications because these are international level certifications that only 
particular bodies can be given well, there can be a pakistani standard uh, yeah. to certify masks uh, and, and other equipment because actually the, the testing procedure is not that difficult it's the um, same for uh, we're looking again at the the different particulate matter and what the basic test for masks or ppes is that they check the efficiency of how much of this small particles is passing through so they're actually testing the pore size and filtration efficiency so without doing uh, certifications you could at least uh, have a standard and have locally available testing done which as yeah. far as i know there is no national yeah. laboratory which even has the equipment to carry out those tests i mean correct me if i'm wrong but it would be great to know that there is such a place because if i'm getting hold of a mask i'd love to even get it tested myself so, i'm uh, i actually checked about this because we wanted to see a certain fabric that uh, the melpon fabric that is used as a filter we wanted to see the products available in pakistan go up to the standard but the bodies responsible within pakistan like pcsir or pakistan uh, the pcsqa which uh, quality assurance organizations none of them had the apparatus required so i'm pretty sure it might be available with some university which has a department which specializes in uh, biochemicals or chem chemicals uh, simple chemistry labs as well but uh, the organizations responsible for the testing and certification uh, are not doing the job of doing it for the government at this time correct correct so we we have a viewer question uh, tamur is asking will the clear skies go away after lockdown um uh, so there are already gray skies in lahore the, the skies in lahore have already turned gray so that's not a question it's already been answered and you uh, as long as you had winds and uh, you had uh, lower vehicle concentration till last week you had blue skies and the clouds were visible but right now today the skies are gray again and uh, all the a lot of vehicles are back on the road as well and you really don't know what's the where are where all of these people are driving to but uh, i go out to grocery shop at 1 pm or 2 pm latest because even my own parents are scared i have immunocompromised uh, uh, grandparents and even my own mother is immunocompromised so we cannot risk it happening within our homes so uh, at least uh, the google mobility report for this week is going to show what sort of trend we are seeing a lot of the traffic is back and the return of the traffic has also brought back the pm 2.5 and nox and so2s so it it isn't going to stay as long uh, maybe when you have monsoon rains again you'll have blue skies but this won't be permanent so so you know i mean we, we're still in a practical lockdown the majority of people are not on the streets uh, the majority of industries are not operating uh, stores are shut down and yet even with a little bit of relaxation on a lockdown we're starting to see uh, elevated levels of air pollution um so what is the solution to all this i mean beyond uh, covid-19 like what should pakistan be doing in fact in, in your article you gave a series of recommendations uh so what are they so uh, the primary issue we keep on going back to in pakistan is uh the sort of energy that we're producing which comes from really really dirty fuels which have been outlawed in most of the developing and the developed world and these are both uh, the low quality diesel we use the low quality gasoline we use and again we keep on coming back to this the sort of fuel used by power stations we have uh, furnace oil we have coal and a lot of local locally available coal is not of a high quality it has a high ash content as well and then you go around these industrial areas you find out what sort of fuel is being used by boilers what sort of fuel is being used within a brick kiln and you find out that they don't even have a, they don't have a proper fuel they are going to use agricultural waste uh, your so, so, wh 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 how how do we you know get better fuel uh, in pakistan well so if you if you talk about let me just when we talk about fuel quality 
the fuel quality for uh, which is publicly available is obviously what the public is going to be dependent on if you're going to be importing or producing or refining low quality fuel the public is going to be using that fuel most of the public 99 of the public are not experts they're not chemical engineers they do not know what sort of petroleum quality is available in pakistan mm. so this is a job which is uh, easily more easy to understand by people who belong to the energy segment that if if there are two options pakistan needs to outlaw the fuels which are high in sulfur content which are a uh, high speed diesel below euro 4 standard and of course the high sulfur furnace oil needs to be outlawed as well it has been outlawed internationally you you cannot sell it to any other country uh, but it still is being it, it's a by product of the refining process so it's going to be made anyway so pakistan needs uh, the solution to all of this is upgrading the refineries or establishing new refineries which may be using technologies like hydro cracking which allow for cleaner variants of fuel to be produced the second part of the solution to this mix is that pakistan needs to start working towards a more uh, eco friendly sustainable renewable model because the current projections as they stand by coming from uh, when you talk about nepra when you talk about ntdc or government bodies linked to energy production and transmission their plans continually say that till 2040 they're going to keep adding power to the grid and a lot of that power is going to come from coal both local and imported coal uh, some of that power is also going to come from renewable sources lng as well and lng so is essentially what we're looking at is that our energy source is so poor that and and to to fix that is the only way or rather the first yeah. thing that needs to be done um just last week there was this report um that was released about our energy uh, forecast for till 2040 and one of the things that mentions is that the profits charged by our energy producers are um criminal and uh, in fact our president had used some very choice words on that in an interview um but i think that's another topic and we need to revisit that um Let's just take uh, another question from our viewers. That does an increase in air pollution result in higher incidence of COVID nineteen? I know you had talked about that earlier, but could you just uh, so summarize it, that? This is uh, fairly. It's sort of a equation that you create that a human being exists. Let's put ten points to a human being, and human beings with uh, with reduced respiratory capabilities. from air pollution or asthma the diseases that come out of air pollution let's minus 5 points out of the 10 and then you have 5 remaining and then further covid is going to further reduce your capacity to defend fend off yourself so a human being with who points say 10 versus 5 is going to always be weak so this is a, a simple question that can be answered this way that people who have grown up who are growing up who live in polluted environments are going to be much more vulnerable and uh, this is something that is being studied in northern italy right now because the milan region itself also uh, sort of suffers from haze and smog in the winter months because if you look up uh, on a map north of milan are the austrian alps and the austrian alps uh, sort of trap a lot of the pollution com- coming out of milan so they trap the pollution towards south which is milan and the cities around it and uh, one of the re- reasons people are see- they we saw a lot of de- deaths in that particular northern italy area is uh, it could be linked to higher amount of travel as well but some scientists are also linking it to higher levels of air pollution so um l- let's uh, wind up the discussion uh with a bunch of recommendations you know we've been talking about air pollution covid-19 uh masks so um what resources would you point uh people to who might want to learn more or you could actually recommend uh anything that you want so if you could give us two or three recommendations uh 
we'll so, uh, add starting, links to them uh, in the this, this is something that in a, i someone on twitter also asked me there is actually a free course that uh, harvard is giving right out right now and it's titled the public health effects of climate change and if you go that sort of where i entered the whole fray as well and i uh, usually introduce the subject this way to a lot of people because it makes it more personal than you know how your families may might be suf suffering in the future as well your offsprings might suffer so personalizing climate change and air pollution and environmental degradation is very very important uh, the first few resources in this regard are obviously going to be the world health organization pages which are uh, offer a very good explainer to what pm 2.5 is and how it is going to affect your health uh, on, on a local level we've put out numerous articles that have come either in print media or on digital media which explain why it is happening in pakistan it explains what sort of uh, proportions each sector is responsible for uh, which fuel is causing a lot of this how much agriculture is responsible so uh, when citizens know where these uh, this this pollution is coming from they can fairly act their uh, representatives and demand from policy makers to start targeting these particular sectors because th these particular sectors are responsible for the air pollution a uh, more targeted approach will bring us uh, short term uh, solutions as well and in the future we can work on a much more long term policy like china has in in right now uh, china has been reducing on average 10 to 15 uh, microgram per cubic meter of uh, pm 2.5 from their air annually and that is what we should be aiming for right now that if we start cleaning up lahore or karachi right now it will take us a minimum of 10 years to go back to moderate or healthy air quality well, I, I don't know if it'll take us 10 years because beijing has shown us a way that where there's a will you can pretty quickly clean up the air uh, yeah. in a couple of years while keeping economic activity um, you know unchecked uh, yeah. in many ways and in fact that is a big misnomer where people believe that cleaning up the environment means that you uh, go into a lockdown like we are today. You know, guess what? When Beijing cleaned up, cleaned up its air, its uh, rate of economic growth did not go down. In fact, it accelerated. Same case for uh, LA very recently in the 1990s. So um, I'd like to also then end with uh, some of my recommendations. Uh, one is the... Um, Tabad Labs uh, Pakistunami podcasts, uh, which just came out uh, yesterday, which talks about that power sector report and why it's a big mess. And, you know, why when we read the media reports that uh, the energy sector is, uh, you know, walking away with uh, huge profits, actually, that's wrong. And so Amar Habib, I believe, takes a deep yeah. dive into the whole accounting of that and, you know, why we uh, misunderstand uh, that. And I think that's a very important thing to know that what role exactly the energy sec sector have, because that is one of the main sectors uh, where we can go after when we talk about improving uh, air quality. Um, the other recommendation that I have is this website, which is called Where a f in mask.com because not enough people are wearing masks you walk around on the streets and yes you see everyone with a mask but uh it'll, it'll be like you know hanging off uh, underneath the nose or it'll be around their uh, chin people aren't really yet aware about the importance of masks so there needs to be a lot of education around it and wear an effing mask is a good place to start to inform yourself and get educated about this whole issue there's a, I would like to add, there's also a Desi version of this. I opened a masksbanao.com. So, masksbanao.com. Banao, B N A O. Oh, Masks Banao, excellent. Yeah, it's, this is a Desi version and it's very, very well designed. Uh, I found about it this two, two days ago and I've been forwarding it to a lot of people. Uh, we can simply be raising awareness of this as well. There are a few questions. If we Should we answer the regarding the fuel quality one question is uh, will, the, will the fuel become more expensive no the fuel be won't become more expensive if you change it to a cleaner source because uh, it's basically being 
the, the refined fuel quality is what we sign up for. If we, we are currently buying a lot of the fuel from Kuwait and uh, it per barrel it doesn't make much of a difference and it won't be passed on to the consumer as such. A actually, Maybe up to rupees. Because the, the, the last one I checked when the fuel prices, I mean, in Pakistan, they've still been the same, but, you know, before the, uh, uh, the barrel price uh, crashed recently, the impact of improving fuel quality in rupee terms was something like one rupee. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the benefits of that is in mm. the billions of dollars of, you know, the improved health, improved, um, you know, uh, uh, you have a lot of health costs and uh, life cycle expectancy, mortality rates, so forth. So there are a lot of indirect benefits from this one rupee cost, which is not even a percentage of the price of oil uh, in Pakistan. So, um, Davar, we, we will, uh, let's answer the rest of the questions uh, in the Facebook chat because we're uh, running close to an hour and it's always good to keep these limited to one hour. And uh, we are going to be looking for more speakers who come up with recommendations and we look forward to uh, hearing your comments about how we did on the show and what topics you would like us to uh, follow up with. So thank you everyone for joining us.